All right. Hello. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Thursday night service. What the church could be. I don't know if you call it official service, but it's a time we come together and uh, we grow in the things of God is what we do. Uh, just real quick. Let me double check. Make sure I got my uh, audio like we always do. Got that all going right and everything's set to go. And I think we are good. All right. I know it has been a while. I apologize not being here on Thursday nights live with you guys just like this. I have definitely missed our times together connecting. I've been going through a healing, uh, I guess about a month ago, a little over a month ago now. I, I fractured my toe. Something fell on it and it fractured one of my toes. So my schedule has been, uh, I've been having to kind of space out some of my energy through my healing process, maintaining Sundays, Saturdays, things like that. So I really haven't been able to get to this part, but I am definitely getting closer to a full recovery, feeling a lot better and glad to be back in this. So what is Thursday night? Just real quick. First of all, if it's your first time checking us out on Thursday night, thanks for connecting. This is about pushing the ideas and the boundaries about who God is. And people get really nervous when we talk verbiage like that because it's like, we're going to miss God. Well, the, the thought that we have exactly arrived at understanding who God is, that is a folly in itself. So we want to push the boundaries of our understanding of God is what that is. We're not leaving the cornerstone of Christ Jesus, but we are challenging our ideals because I recognize I'm a flawed human being. I recognize that I have spots in my life that I don't understand. I can look back at, you know, in my late 30s here, looking at my when I was, you know, a teenager to my 20s to when I was first 30 and look at how my ideals of God, who is love, by the way, has progressed. And there was a time in my life I didn't understand God is love. So we're going to get right in this. Let me open up prayer because I think that's a good segue to that and picking up right where I want to go tonight. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time of the word. We thank you for the, this time spending with you as you minister to us, as you challenge us, as you cause us to move forward in our understanding about you ultimately as love. We open our eyes, ears, and hearts to receive it. I admit I need you to orchor, orchestrate this whole time and, and order my steps and articulate my words. Words. May it point people back to you, ultimately, God, and may it be an on-time word for your precious people. In Jesus' name, amen. By the way, I know we're right in the holiday stretch. Uh, whether it's, you know, uh, you, you're in the midst of whatever portion of that, man, just happy holidays, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, all those good things. We we celebrate everything that we have just been going through. I know it's after Christmas now and in the New Year season, man, and expecting all God's goodness at the top of this new year. And uh, we're, we're just excited about all that. So uh, I just want to send all that love from Nicole and I, you know, all the holiday seasons well and greetings to you all. So let's get right into this, though. What I've been talking about, this was a uh, now, I believe a couple Sundays ago, by the way, uh, is uh, in some of my time, I've been preaching so many different messages and going at it. Some of it overlaps. So forgive me if some of my references are a little off. Uh, but I was talking about on a Sunday morning, the God who is empathetic. You know, for 2024, our year is focused on empathy. What we've been really focusing on is a lot what Thursday night is all about, is expanding our understanding about who God is and seeing God better clearly as love. See, it's one thing to say, God, uh, God loves you, but it's another thing to even take it to another level where you say, God is love, and that is God's nature. And when we understand God's nature, we start now realigning, recalibrating our understanding, the word, and everything else to match just that. So as we get going here, um, one, one thing I want to be clear about, the God who is empathetic, and I didn't say pathetic. You know, a lot of times we hear empathetic and we think pathetic. And we see it as weak a lot of times. It takes a lot of strength to be empathetic. And empathetic is saying, I can care about how you feel. I can understand maybe how you feel. And one thing when we challenge ourselves to be empathetic, we need to understand God is that first. Because as we understand who God is and God loves us, we're able to pass that forward to others is what we're able to do. So as we get to that part about the God who is empathetic, man, God really can understand our weaknesses is what I will point out. When I was introduced to my understanding about God and who God is, I understood a God who is um, a God ultimately who is um, who is wrathful, who is judgmental. 
who is doing all these things and um, would punish us and be out to get us is what I'm trying to say ultimately is what it is. Instead of a God now, as I've grown in my understanding of God, a God who can be compassionate even when I mess up, a God who can be merciful to my mistakes and my shortcomings, a God who can make space for my flawed humanity and not respond in a hateful, fearful, uh, cursing, punishing way, but actually responds in a nurturing way. Uh, that's what shifted. And when I create that environment, the environment it creates for me in my mind, especially for my faith to thrive, it creates a, an environment of love, an environment of feeling safe with God and my relationship with God, which allows me ultimately come to a place, man, I trust you, God, is what I do. And I'm in the business of trusting you. So as we go through this, that's what I want to kind of point towards tonight, ultimately, is what I want to do. Excuse me, just a second here. So... Um, so I had a little bit of technical difficulties there. So, um, one thing, and just make sure we keep on track here. So when we, when we come to this, let's go to our first scripture, Galatians 5, 6, and really dig on into this. I'm going to go about 30 minutes and we're going to crank this out and then we'll come back again and I'll, I'll kind of pick up where we left off more than likely. But understanding this God of empathy is a God of love that makes us feel safe. And what happens, trust, which is faith can thrive in that. It's hard to trust a God that you're afraid of. I take my son, for example. You know, I can motivate my son to obey me. I can motivate my son to serve me. I can motivate my son to do his chores, to do his homework, to do all those things. And I can use fear and get all those results. I can make him afraid of me and motivate him to do the right thing. But it won't create trust between us. It won't create a relationship with us. It won't create a safe space for us. It won't create the best because he's always going to be afraid of me. And it, it in the, the intimate moments will never happen in there. It will be ser seriously, I'm performing for you to avoid your wrath. And that is a reflection of, our, especially my early days of Christianity, what we learned in church. But it's different when my son, and I've built this relationship with him where he's motivated like, oh, there's a sense of trust and love that is motivating us. I understand, hey, why I need to do my chores because as a community, as a house together, as a relationship together, we want our home to function and be in the best place it can possibly be. But it has nothing to do with fear. Oh, I'm motivated to do my schoolwork because I'm buying into the idea and growing into the idea of, oh, this matters to me. Not only am I doing this because I'm afraid, but I want good grades. I want that for myself. I want to experience a better life because what those things will get me access to. Not because I'm motivated because I need to make sure I avoid my dad's, my dad's anger and my wrath. You get what I'm saying? So we go to the scripture of Galatians 5, 6 says, For when we place our faith in Christ, when we come to the awareness, when we awaken to the fact, this revelation of grace, by the way, is what it's talking about. There is no benefit in being circumcised or being uncircumcised. What is important is faith expressing itself in love. See, what we focus on as human beings, a lot of times we focus on a lot of the rules and regulations. And we think that's what God wants us to emphasize. We think we, God wants us to keep the big ten, ten Commandments. We think God wants us to make sure we perform for him. And the biggest revelation of Jesus was that is not true. That God wants you to simply see him as love and that he loves us and that to trust in that love. And then what do we do? We pay it forward to others. That's the whole thing, because a God of empathy no longer, here's the thing, it is very anti um, a God of always trying to remedy sin all the time. Because an empathetic God says, you know what, I know you got some issues over here, but I'm going to bless you anyways. Religion can't contain that. But a real relationship with God does flow like that. And that was the beauty of we see in Galatians 4. How does faith work? How does trust work? Because I know I laid a lot of statements, so let me connect some scripture to it. How does faith really work in an environment that you know you are loved? I can trust God because I know he's always for me. But I have to come to the place that I believe that. And, I, and here's why it's so important and why I would preach this on a Thursday night. Most of the church world I hear and I grew up in doesn't teach that. It's not that they don't teach that scripture. 
but they don't teach us the fact that they still add and mix all in there. God's going to curse you if you don't, or God's going to withhold blessing. That's not environment safety. That's not environment trust. That is not create environment where faith can latch on to this God. God blesses me no matter what. How can you say that? Because God really is that big. And I, and I, I finally realized that and started quitting making, because I realized my God, my version of God was too small. My version of God was weak. My version of God in the cross was very low in power, very low in authority is what it was. And so our focus has to come off the rules. That's the beauty. When we finally, when it's talking about, what's it talking about? We place our faith in Jesus Christ. It takes faith to truly believe that God will bless you even when you fall short. It takes true faith to truly believe God will bless you when you messed up. And here's when I started seeing it. When I had my bad days that didn't match the quote-unquote living by faith to get blessed rules and the blessing showed up anyways, I started realizing, oh, God is just going to be good no matter what. The other side of it, though, what was frustrating and disheartening to my faith, when I knew I did everything right, when I knew I was trusting God perfectly and I didn't see anything show up. And I realized... A lot of that, the, the lot of the system that was created out of that was us and our misunderstandings of word. And it was a small God. And I believed and taught all these things. I had to go back and start reexamining. This is not working. God is not fitting my understanding right now. God keeps going outside of it, which is just beautiful when you realize that. that God, one of the biggest things that God does to stretch our understanding, he'll start moving outside of it. And all of a sudden, I started seeing, well, God, man, we'll, we'll be performing and doing everything right with faith, and you don't do anything. But we'll have the dumbest moment, and we'll have a, a complete faith failure, and you show up. And that doesn't mean I don't operate in faith. It means the systems and the performance. And I started realizing, oh, I came to this understanding. My faith is not to move God. My faith is to deal with me. Me trusting God doesn't get God to move because God says, I'll bless you no matter what. I'll be good to you no matter what. Faith deals with me. Trusting God deals with me. It keeps my emotions anchored. It keeps my thoughts anchored. It keeps me from doing something stupid at the same time. But it's not about trying to get God to move. It's about how I'm going to move through life, though. So I'm not, it's, I'm trying to, it's that fine balance and I'm always looking for a better way to describe it because it's like, sounds a little vague. I'm still working on vocabulary or how to explain this a little better and, 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 and define this a little better because I don't want you to ever think I'm throwing out faith. No, faith is essential to the Christian life. Faith in God is a necessity. Don't think I'm throwing out faith. I'm talking about how you appropriate it, what motivates it, its purpose and it's why I'm rearranging that's what my understanding shifted. My faith is not a form to appease God to get blessings or avoid curses. Nah, that's what I started realizing. My faith in God, man, is just simply so I can, I, I can live in this life confident. I can live in this life secure. I can move in conjunction with God. I can flow with God with some things. My faith serves me by keeping me together ultimately is what it does. So, I, I don't, faith was always presented as this transactional thing instead of just accepting what is. I accept God as love. I accept God as human. I don't pray for God to heal me. That's, I just accept it. I don't pray for God to forgive me. I just accept it as truth, as a declaration, not as a transaction. I know it's hard to start shifting, and some of this you're going to have to spend time with it. Some of it's what we've been massaging over and over. But back to this part about God is empathetic. When you realize God is a non-transactional God, you realize, and the reason I talked about it, I didn't want empathy and God's love to be contaminated with that transactional point. So I'll go to my next scripture, 1 John 4, 19. I can't tell people all year as a pastor in our church to be empathetic and to put empathy in action without first you realizing God is empathetic towards us. 1 John 4, 19 says, we love each other because he loved us first. Let me say it this way. We are empathetic towards each other because he is empathetic towards us first. How, where do you get that from? Where do you get that from? 
Let's go to Hebrews. I'm glad you asked. Hebrews 4, 15 through 16, it says, This high priest of ours, if you back up, you'll realize it's talking about Jesus, just in the previous two verses. So Jesus, this high priest of ours, understands our weaknesses. For he faced all the same testings we uh, do, yet he did not sin. So let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive his mercy, and we will find grace to help us when we need it most. Now, that was a lot we put in this from the NLT, by the way. I've been reading from the NLT tonight. This high priest of our understands that is, in this context, that is empathy. You could put, he is empathetic towards our weaknesses. You could say it that way and mean the same way. He is easily touched with our infirmities or our feelings or what it is. See, God cares about the fact, even he cares about you even when you're going through things, you're, you're struggling through things. Because it says, he faced it all too. He went through it all too. Of course, he didn't sin, he overcame it. But when you realize God cares about those things, and I'll go through stories, you know, examples, because we're going to look back at Jesus' life, because you're going to find... You know, of course, if you're pulling from all the Old Testament stuff, you're going you're gonna to see a misunderstanding as people walking in a limited light of this angry, wrath-filled God. I don't, I don't think God changed. Because in the same, Hebrew says, same yesterday and today forever. And I know we look at the cross as all of a sudden a character change of God. And I disagree with that. I used to believe in that, but I disagree with that. You're preaching against some of the big preachers right now, I know, and some of you, you're connected to. Maybe. Not really. I'm not trying to, but maybe. But if you don't make this switch, you're always going to be living in this transactional religion. I do not believe the, God, the cross changed God. I believe the cross was an unveiling of who God always was. Remember, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. What, every time when you go back and you start looking at the context when he said that many times, he was bringing enlightenment to people's lack of understanding. And so Jesus unveiled. Because here's the thing, you can go through the four Gospels, which we'll go through some of those accounts between the, if I get to them tonight or the next time we come together, and I'm going to show you where pre-cross Jesus was empathetic. Jesus was not wrathful. Jesus was actually very anti-wrath and judgment. No cross had happened. And so what I'm saying is, you know, our, our, our lack of understanding, that small-minded version of God, we thought, instead of recognizing there's an enemy, instead of recognizing all the issues, take, take Job, for example. You go over to Job, you read in verse one, chapter 1, he talks about the Lord gives and the Lord takes the way. And blessed be the name of the Lord. And we made a whole doctrine all that. But we didn't go to the final chapter over, I believe, which was 42, when Job realized, oh, when he prayed for his friends and, and, and turned and realized, oh, God restored him to double. Well, it wasn't the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Job was speaking out of his anguish like we do. Oh, man, I thought God was against me. Because that was a trap the enemy wanted to get Job into. The enemy wanted to get Job to believe, and he was trying to use his friends. He was pr putting pressure on his own wife. He told him, well, why don't you just go ahead and die? Because clearly you ticked off this guy. And, 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 it's, and I feel for him because Job lost everything. I mean, stuff that many of us have never experienced in our life, especially in that much of an intense level. You know, his kids all died. I mean, just, just all kind of craziness. Now, some people can relate to a measure of that and been through similar things. But what is the number one thing the enemy tries to get you to do? Oh, it was your lack of performance because you see that. They were like, well, you clearly ticked off God. They made it about Joe's behavior. It's such a beautiful example of humanity's misunderstanding of God and really a gracious God that was back then operating towards Job, not realizing there was a devil that went loose. Not realize it. And they even have bad misunderstandings that, oh, God just released the devil on people. And that's where they get that thing. God didn't release the devil on people. The devil already didn't need God's permission to be crazy. Chaos doesn't need God's permission to be crazy. We live in a world like that now. We, we have our flawed self, flawed human beings. We do have some form of, maybe we don't all understand what to describe as some form of an evil presence that drives things in a destructive way that we associate as the devil. 
But the number one thing that wanted to do was convince Job that God was against him and that maybe God wanted this to happen and that maybe God was really trying to teach Job something because if the enemy could have got Job to accept that, Job would have released his hope in God, his faith in God, and just been like, well, I guess I accept it and probably died and never would have saw the restoration of everything even back better than it was. See, that's what happens if we don't think God is empathetic, that God is a love, that God can easily see our weaknesses. In that moment, when Job said, the Lord gives, the Lord takes away, God was clearly with Job and for Job and empathetic with Job. Every bit of that. So you, you have to understand, God, when you mess up, and why is it so important? What, what's the big deal? He understands our weakness. He understands our weaknesses and says, you know what? I'm not going to pile on you. I'm not going to make things harder on you because you fell short. I'm not going to punish you for falling short. That's the importance of realizing God understands when we are weak and we fall short and we don't measure up. And because God understands, God says, I'm still going to bless you anyways. That's how big the love of God is. And, and here's how you know. How do you know that? Man, you look at your own kids. What happens when, now we get in the other mode. Well, you've seen the destructiveness of these two ways of living life. You've seen it, and I've participated in this, where I was just hard on people. I was harsh on people. You messed up. I'm not tolerating that. You need to be right. You need to get that right. And, and you better make that happen. And da, 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 this and that. Versus, you know the difference when you see your kids struggle. And they fell short. You know, I've seen my son come home, and he's been more upset about it probably than I was and fall short on his grades. In that moment, in his upset, in his disappointment, I don't take away his phone and everything from him. Just because he came home with a bad grade. Now, we're going to talk about it. We're going to ask questions of, well, what did you do here? Did we follow the study programs? Did we follow... Um, do you need tutoring? Do you need extra help? Did you double check your work? Did you turn it in on time? We'll go through all those things and I will hold him accountable to those things. But when that kid's already feeling bad enough about it, what the heck do I need to do? Because I can understand what it is when I fall short. I understand when at work now as an adult, I don't get an assignment done on time. I mess up on the assignment and have to redo it and explain it to my boss. See, I understand that, and I understand it because I've had bosses that just grill me for it, ministry and secular, and I've also had bosses that were empathetic towards me, and I know the difference. And the ones that grilled me didn't make me, didn't motivate me in a good way to want to be better, actually. The ones that were more empathetic actually made me want to work harder and do it better the next time. Now, don't get me wrong. There's people that take advantage of it. There's people. I get all that. But here's the thing. Being hard on people, people are going to do what people want to want. want. Being hard on people is just going to stress you out. But my point, why are you making all the point? If you can get that, because every bit of it, you're like, oh, I can, I can relate to that. I can. Then if you as a human being can get that, <laughs> I'm not mad at anybody. I'm passionate. If you as a human being can get that, how much more the God who, of the universe who is love? Where do you think you get that from? You don't get it from the devil. You don't get it from evil. You don't get it from hate. Where Then where does it come from? Ding, it comes from God. So if you as a human being can even recognize that and operate in that being flawed and imperfect, you who being evil, as Jesus talked about, can give good gifts to your kids, by the way, that whole example. How much more can the God of the universe who is love do it better than even we can see we got the shift our everything about tonight all i've been trying to do especially on thursday night can you see god differently can you stop seeing god through the through the lens of fear through the lens of hate through the thin, lens of wrath through the lens of judgment and actually see god for who he really is which is love and take a step back and quit cherry-picking scriptures that identify with the wrath in the small self. 
and start realizing, man, this is who Jesus is. If it, do we really? Because here's the thing: we're professing Jesus all day, but we don't follow Jesus. We don't. We follow. Well, what the Old Testament prophets? I don't give a rip about any of those Old Testament prophets. I don't care if you ever. Here's, I'm going to get ugly for a moment. This is going to make a lot of preachers mad, a lot of people mad. I don't ever care if you read any of the Old Testament prophets. If you never read them, you, you, you'd be fine with God for the rest of your life. If you never read the book of Revelation, you'd be fine for, with God for the rest of your life. It's not a necessity to experience the fullness of God. <gasps> Can it enhance? Yeah, but it's actually done more harm than good. Does that make that book wrong, bad, evil, or unuseful? Absolutely not. It's narrow-minded people, self-centered people, small self people that take those scriptures, hijack them, weaponize them, misappropriate. They're there for our learning experience, but they're not there to live by. Where do you get that from? How dare you? Well, I guess Paul's a liar. Let's get let's get a little dogmatic with it for a moment. I guess Paul is an idiot and a liar, and everything he wrote in the New Testament is straight garbage. Because that's what you're gonna tell me. Because old Paul, he talked about it over in Ephesians. Oh, Jesus is the cornerstone. It's like, where are you getting this from? I look at Jesus and I look at Paul, and I can tell you this stuff in the past is wrong. Because Paul took it and said, Jesus is our cornerstone. You build all your revelation off him. I don't build my revelation off the prophets. I don't build my revelation about God off the Old Testament. I don't build my revelation of God off all these humans listed through the Bible. I learn from them. I allow them to give me perspective. I allow me to give uh, the, the progression of God. But I don't start there. That's not the starting place I build my cornerstone of the rest of the house off of. Because in the next part of that scripture, it says he's the cornerstone. It says all the laws and the prophets hang on him. What is it saying there? When the prophets and the laws contradict Jesus, Jesus supersedes as the higher authority. The living word always supersedes the written word. In the living word, who is love, John 1 over there says, God came down in flesh. The word came down and dwelt among us. The word. Man, you have to filter everything through the prophets. And when the prophets, all of a sudden something contradicts, Jesus is the winner of that. That's how I landed these places in these revelations. Because then you look at the four Gospels and you see how Jesus was empathetic towards people. And that's where we're coming back next week. Empathetic each and every time. Loving each and every time. Every time we say that. So back to the scripture. So when we wake up, why is it so important to wake up to an empathetic God? When you were at your weakest moment, when you made your biggest mess, when you fell short, when you didn't keep the rules, when you didn't keep the laws, you still need to know God says, I don't care. I see past this. I'm going to bless you anyways. I'm going to love you anyways. I'm going to protect you anyways. Uh, that's It takes faith to believe that. And it says in verse 16, as we just read, so let us come boldly, unreservedly, Fully assured, fully confident to the throne of what? Our gracious God, not our wrathful God, not our judgmental God. And there, what will you receive? We'll receive mercy. Oh, that's not judge and wrath. You'll receive mercy. And we will also find grace to help us when we need it the most. Let me tell you, I... Remember when I didn't believe God loved me and how empathetic God could be towards me. And the biggest thing I had the hardest time, and here's what happens where faith doesn't thrive, I never would ask God for help. I tried to fix it on my own or like I need to pay God back. I never would ask God for help. I never would reach out and say, because I was too afraid. I was too afraid of God. And I didn't understand I could embrace God and find mercy. I could embrace God and find grace. So I would dismiss the grace of God in my life, dismiss the mercy of God in my life, which was showing up in my life. 
I was literally rejecting it as it was flowing. I couldn't receive it. He would send people in my life to be a blessing to me, people in my life being merciful. And it was all my own internal condemnation, shame, and guilt that was destroying me Not and that was projecting judgment, projecting wrath, protect, projecting all those imagery in the enemy was just sitting there laughing back saying, see, I got you. But man, when I came over Revelation, this God truly is love. All things got a million times better in my life. And I was able to go before God and say, I receive it. I receive it. And I am so much stronger in my faith for it today. I believe in God so much more than I used to in my faith today. And I receive more grace than ever. I won't keep you long because it's the holiday time right here. We're right at 30 minutes roughly. So I'm going to close it up right here. Uh, we'll pick this up next time. And, and I'll give you some examples where... Jesus went through and was empathetic. But man, I hope you're you're taking these little things. Go back and listen to these and, and just let it reshape your ideas about God. God is truly love and we have to come to believe it. All right, blessings to you. Enjoy this holiday season. I'll come back to you next time and uh, love you all. Have a great night.